Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke and I'm the coordinator of these brown bags. If you are interested in these programs, please join our membership. You can go to preservelincoln.org to join. Um, today is the seventh in a series of lectures with Jim McKee. Support for this series is provided by Speedway Properties. Please join me in thanking Speedway Properties for their generous support of the videotaping and other expenses associated with this series. Our speaker today is Jim McKee. Jim is a lifelong Lincolnite. His great-grandparents pioneered in Lancaster County in the 1870s. He has a bachelor's degree from UNL and operates J and L Lee Company, a publisher of regional books as well as the coinery. Jim has written over a thousand articles and books on Lincoln and Nebraska history. Um, he's on the Historical Society Board of Trustees and he also serves on the City of Lincoln Historic Preservation Commission. And he's, he is also a founding member of the Preservation Association of Lincoln. Um, this is the seventh of a series of over 25 talks over the next couple of years. And the series is titled, Jim McKee's Complete History of Lincoln, and this program is number seven. Um, our next program will be next month in February, on February 11th. So Jim invites you to ask questions during the program. So please join me in welcoming Jim McKee. Last time we left off with the smoking fence, the university fence, and this is the slide that we closed with, and I didn't realize there were a couple more pictures of the, the smoking fence. The only thing which I don't think I inserted last time was the fact that probably Seton and Lee down in the Haymarket were the uh, manufacturers of the fence. After the fence was torn down, we mentioned that the gates ended up elsewhere. Uh, for a while, one of those gates sat right on the campus, and here's a student apparently not realizing that the fence is no longer there, but still going through the gates. And that was from an annual. Then uh, the fence will take up another life down at the end of the mall, uh, or the end of the street where on the left would be the football stadium and dead ahead uh, would have been where Reverend McKesson's house, uh, one of the people who uh, originated the Lancaster female a Methodist Protestant female seminary uh, was living right there down on what, when I was in school, I think was a baseball field. And when the Burlington Station in Omaha was redone, they removed all of the columns and sent them to Lincoln. Some of them were stored by the Ables in their yard. Uh, others were used by the university uh, at the foot of, I guess that would be 11th Street, and if we're looking dead to the north here. And then around there or in between, they stuck pieces of the fence uh, and two of the gates. The top of the gate right there is the seal of the University of Nebraska, the 1869 seal. We're looking off towards the southeast and we can see the singing silo over there, which is the Mueller Tower. Uh, in this picture, we can see that ivy has been allowed to grow up on the columns, which I think really made them look neat. Uh, and the story goes, whether it's apocryphal or not, we're not sure, but uh, when they took down the fence, a secretary in the administration building asked what was going to happen uh, to the fence, and they said that the fence would be moved to Wayuka, and she then asked, what about the gates? Uh, and it was obvious that uh, Wayuka was not interested in the gates, so she said she would like to purchase uh, two of the gates, give them back to the university to be, to be erected uh, with parts of the fence uh, along in the columns. And so we do see that today. Um, there was a great story about the columns, which I presume was true, I don't know, and that was that if a virgin would ever walk between them, they would collapse. Um, possibly true. I went down and checked them the other day. They seem to be in good shape. Uh, I don't know, but the vines, the ivy is now gone. That's one thing that you won't see anymore. Pretty stark, and of course, overshadowed completely by the East Stadium to their left. Uh, what we want to talk about primarily today is, in some ways, what's called the first building to be built off uh, the University of Nebraska campus. Uh, and in a way, it's the University of Nebraska building, and in a way, it isn't. Uh, Willard Kimball is the man that is responsible for this building. Uh, although we know that 
music was taught at the University of Nebraska clear back in the 1870s, it didn't get much emphasis. Willard Kimball uh, left his mark on the university with this building we see here. Uh, he was born in 1854 in Columbus, Ohio. His father was, interesting, interestingly enough, the first manufacturer of railroad cars in the state of Ohio. Uh, a remark which he, or a distinguishing mark which he often alluded to. He went to the Conservatory of Music in Boston, uh, 1871, graduated from there with highest honors, went on uh, to Germany, Leipzig, where he studied two years, then came back to the United States and became the director of the school where he had uh, gone to school. He was director of pipe organ at what was then known as the Iowa Conservatory of Music at Iowa College. Iowa College later will change its name to Grinnell College, which we know it by today. So with the coming of James Canfield to the University of Nebraska, um, Acting Chancellor Bessie uh, entered into this. He nominated uh, Canfield, and he brought him in 1891 to be the new chancellor of the University of Nebraska. And one of the things that they wanted to concentrate on was expanding the music program at the University of Nebraska. But unfortunately, as Canfield arrived, uh, the Depression of 1893 uh, began. Enrollment dropped, funding from the state dropped. We know all about state funding dropping. Uh, and so what Canfield did was he went to the regents and suggested an experiment in place of hiring um, Kimball to work for the University of Nebraska that they establish a private school of music, which would be possibly for a time even headquartered in uh, the University Hall, that first building which we saw last week, last month I should say. Even though it was overcrowded, he thought that they might locate in there temporarily while a new building might be built. The school, which would be created, would not be owned by the University of Nebraska. Uh, however, university credits would transfer both to and from this college, sort of, of music. Uh, there was already a college of music in the city of Lincoln, a pretty good-sized one, which was started by a man by the name of Professor Oliver Howell. Um, Howell had built a... $50,000 brick building on the southeast corner of 11th and L, which would put it today caddy corner from the Cornesker Hotel. There's a concrete block building in there. And we'll talk about that building probably two or three, perhaps, sessions from now. But at any rate, he had started it um, in the 1890s, and it seemed to be operating successfully but as soon as Willard Kimball got here, one of the first things he tried to do was to purchase that building, and he thought he could buy it at auction, and he was thinking that he might get it for as little as $10,000. Now, what made him think this? I can't be sure, because it seemed that the school was, even despite this depression of 1893, the school was at this point still doing okay and would continue on for a good long time. Well. Kimball came to the University of Nebraska, uh, none, or University, and to Lincoln, nonetheless, after serving at 18 years as the head of the music department at Grinnell. Uh, he came first in 1893, and he acquired a house at 409 North 25th Street, uh, near what would later be called University Professors Row, an area of houses along both uh, R Street and in that general area. Uh, so when he could not buy that building, what he did do was buy the lots, and I don't know whether it was two or three, on the southeast corner of 11th and R Streets, which is directly across the street from the University of Nebraska's original four square block, roughly 10 acre campus. So it would have been off the campus. Uh, architects originally called for a four story building. This building, as we see it here, uh, is three stories plus what we call a sunlight basement, something like that. The original architect's drawings called for a four-story building, and in fact, the original building was two stories plus the four story or this full sunlight basement. Uh, so in October of 1894, construction began on this building, which was ultimately to cost, in its original form, $30,000. And the first year, he had 57 students uh, sign up for classes and four faculty members. The lower level, the sunlight level, we'll call it, was a dining room. The first level had offices and classrooms. The upper floor, which is, this is the building expanded, so think of uh, what appears to be the third floor, really the second floor of the building, uh, was a dormitory for young ladies. 
Each room had its own practice piano in it, so it was a formidable building. Some people's reports show that Professor Kimball and his wife actually lived in this building, uh, but I've been unable to confirm it because if you look at the city directories, we have him living off campus or off that building uh, for some little time. So if he lived in the building, it must have been very briefly. Uh, and at that time, uh, he announced that first year that all credits at his school would be transferred to the University of Nebraska. Now, as an aside, at that time, uh, we also have the Trans-Mississippi Exposition in Omaha, which another Kimball was the architect of, no relation at all. But Willard Kimball was called to be the music director of this, what is sometimes called a World's Fair, the Trans-Mississippi Exposition. Um, there, he designed a pipe organ to be put in the building, uh, and this was in the auditorium of the building, area of the grounds, and it would be over in what would be about Pinckney and one of the numbered streets, maybe 19th today, clear in the southeastern corner of the grounds. Uh, it was called a Fine Three Manual Organ, which was manufactured by the Moeller Company of Harry, Harry Hagerston, excuse me, Maryland. Uh, it had four divisions, 34 stops, 40 registers, 30 ranks, and 2,255 2, pipes, so a good size organ. In 1898, the year of the exposition, the initial concert was performed by Harry Wilde, a eminent organist from Chicago. Uh, unfortunately, Willard Kimball had somehow gotten in crosswise with the people of Omaha, uh, primarily the music teachers, uh, the music store owners and music uh, aficionados in, in general, uh, and only about five or six weeks into the opening of the fair, they severed, and Willard Kimball gave up that position, uh, and a man from Omaha by the name of Thomas Kelly took over. So he came back to Lincoln and really had put together the fair and the music program, but didn't oversee it. Interestingly, too, Professor Kimball had the last laugh on the exposition because at the close of the fair, which only ran a few months, uh, a group in Lincoln of alumni purchased that organ for $3,000. Uh, and I don't know what the original cost was, but I'm sure it was considerably more than that. They disassembled it and brought it to the University of Nebraska. Now, it gets a little bit complicated here because the University of Nebraska's chapel was originally in that original building, University Hall, we'll call it. Uh, but at about this time, a little before that, Grant Hall was built. We talked about that last time. And on the west edge of Grant Hall, they built an annex to the chapel. And they reinstalled, reassembled the organ from the Trans-Mississippi Exposition in that building. And it sat there and operated for almost probably 60 years uh, before it was idled. And at that point, the organ became what they said was irreparable. Uh, and it just sat and moldered away and probably uh, sat there until, in fact, we're sure of it, until Grant Memorial Hall was torn down and raised. Uh, ultimately, that's where Sheldon Art Gallery will be built, and the organ just simply disappeared. Whatever happened to it, it was not salvaged, although, uh, as been pointed out, almost every organ that's ever built of any consequence can be rebuilt, but this one was not. It was just thrown away. In 1903, Kimball's faculty donated money to what we will see shortly uh, it will be known as the Temple Building with the understanding that they would be able to have concerts in the Temple Building, something which did not come about because Grant Memorial Hall also had an auditorium and apparently used that one all the time. In 1900, Kimball reincorporated his School of Music and he called it the University School of Music but did not use the word Nebraska in it. So not the University of Nebraska School of Music, just the University School of Music uh, in this building right here. And he also built a new home at 1936D, which is extant and uh, uh, one of the homes in, uh, in that historic district that we see, I think, Pal and others have had open houses over there. They still could credit, uh, transfer credits from the music school to the University of Nebraska, but in 1910, 1911, uh, the university questioned this. Should this go on or not? Uh, apparently it did, uh, but they questioned it, and it was some point they thought would probably withdraw this, but they did not. Then in 1910, uh, the school had proved profitable enough that $10,000 was taken from their profits from tuition to build the top floor we see here, 
uh, which makes it look like a four-story building, but really is still a third, three-story building, which they are hopefully still planning on adding to. Uh, never happened. And when they decided to use Grant Memorial Hall for auditorium, the top floor which he had built here, he had originally planned for an auditorium, but decided Grant would be very usable, so they turned that into 30 more rooms for practice rooms and for dormitory rooms. Uh, at that time, he has 800 students uh, registered for classes, and I'm thinking that probably a lot of this 800 were students that maybe signed up for one class uh, in music. Uh, I can't believe that he had 800 full-time students, uh, but he did have a faculty at that time of 40, and he was advertising himself as the largest music school west of the Missouri River. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's hard to say, because that's an advertisement, and people tend to say whatever they want. Uh, shortly after this, um, the management of the school will have gone to Willard Kimball's son, George Kimball, and Willard Kimball will now be living over in the house um, with his daughter, actually his daughter, Catherine, will own the house over on D Street which is about three houses west of First Plymouth Congregational uh, Church on D Street, if you're curious. And at that point in time, the University of Nebraska will purchase the School of Music from the Kimball family, supposedly for $100,000. I don't see Kay here, so I was hoping she would be able to clarify some of this, but supposedly for $100,000. But what they did was they didn't give him $100,000. They gave the family $10,000 and then said that the additional $90,000 would be paid off through tuition that the University of Nebraska would see, receive and that money would go to him. Well, I don't know. We've lost track of it. And I can't find out the answer whether it is or not. Because unfortunately, 1907, another depression comes through. The School of Music and the University of Nebraska will have another period where things don't do so well. So the fourth floor of the building was never built. I think that uh, on the postcard that Eileen sent out, we show the architect's drawings for the building as if it were four stories, uh, four stories plus a sunlight basement, but it was never, ever built. Now, the building was raised in the 1960s, uh, and in 1969, they built the Kimball Recital Hall, uh, which is attached to uh, the Leeds Center. Um, and in fact, you can get through it, I think, now. But it is named for Kimball, and in fact, if you attend a concert or a recital in that building, if you look to the left of the stage, you'll see an oil painting of Kimball. Uh, the next building uh, will be the uh, other building, which is going to be built off campus, and that will be the Temple Building, which just shortly ago turned uh, 100. Uh, Beginning in 1900, the University of Nebraska was really already beginning to feel growing pains, not just for the University Hall, but for the original 10-acre campus. Uh, and at that point in time, American universities, in other words, not just the University of Nebraska, but American universities in general, uh, were given a warning uh, by their association that they should not accept donations from businessmen in general, and specifically from John D. Rockefeller. Um, they said that they were at risk, that they might lose their control of academics, that if people gave money, individuals, that they might want to dictate what was taught in that building, for example. Uh, they wanted the universities to be free from outside business pressure, so they suggested that they not do it. In mid-April of 1903, uh, John D. Rockefeller gave a pretty sizable gift to Grand Island Baptist College and it set up a sort of a warning to the regents that he might be considering giving money to the University of Nebraska. Can't have that, can we? Uh, now, Benjamin E. Andrews had just come to the University of Nebraska at this point. He had been at Brown University, and because many people thought that uh, E. Benjamin Andrews' removal from Brown had been engineered by Rockefeller, they thought there's no danger of Rockefeller giving any money to the University of Nebraska because they thought these two were oil and water, that they did not get along. But in fact, E. Benjamin Andrews was a friend of John D. Rockefeller's because Rockefeller's son had attended Brown University. They became friends at that point in time. So on April 12th, it was announced that Rockefeller would give the University of Nebraska two-thirds of a, a grant to build a new building 
uh, which he called a combined student building and religious center. And that, of course, got people's attention right away. Uh, but later, they s sort of changed that, and they, they probably indicated or hinted that maybe a better definition would be a student union sort of building. Um, the building would cost $100,000. Two-thirds of it would be supplied by Rockefeller. The rest would be supplied by donors, uh, hopefully people from the uh, Lincoln area and friends of the university across the state. This is the same way the LEED Center was built, with sort of a matching or a challenge grant, if you will. Uh, donors to the building would have to come up with, of course, uh, a third, $33,333.33 of the funds. Um, and they had to have that money by January the 1st of 1904 for Rockefeller. That was the stipulation. He would uh, pull it back. Now, the regents were pretty happy about this because they were afraid that if they included in any building on the campus the functions of the YMCA or the YWCA, that there might be a question of separation of church and state involved. So they thought this might answer that. Uh, and separate them from the church-state controversy. Uh, to that end, Mr. Andrews personally purchased land off of the university campus. The chancellor, in his own name, with his own money, bought the three lots uh, on the southeast corner of 12th and R Street, also off the campus. Uh, he was afraid if he didn't buy it, not that he wanted to profit from it, but he was afraid if he didn't purchase land, adjacent to the university, that speculators would get a hold of it thinking that the price could be driven up. So that was his entire thought. And at that time, there was a building standing on it uh, that looks like it was probably like an apartment building, something like this. Then the regents will approve reimbursing um, Andrews $8,000 for what he spent for those lots, but they will be very careful in their no noting the money back to Andrews that there's no mention of Rockefeller. Uh, and, and a lot of people outside of Lincoln particularly were still looking at this gift with great concern. Uh, in fact, the World Herald uh, was a great uh, foe of it, and they editorialized that the University of Nebraska and the state of Nebraska did not want or need Rockefeller's ill-gotten funds. Now, Ida Tarbell had just written a biography of uh, Rockefeller, rather scathing, um, and so it was a popular, in some areas, feeling that Rockefeller's money was not to be trusted. William Jennings Bryan had been the editor of the World Herald, and he said, Rockefeller's money is tainted with oil. We cannot accept it. We accept it. <laughs> uh, Lincolnites and faculty and others, including the faculty of the Music College, did come up with about $30,000, uh, and that money was put at interest and almost immediately uh, came up to the $33,333. Uh, but the World Herald continued to try to escalate the problem to, to no, no uh, end, no good end. The Palladian gave money, uh, some of the, the Union Society, which was a debating society, gave money, and many other people. And on December the 13th, 1904, the Regents approved uh, the construction of the Temple Building, which we see here going up, uh, Omaha architect John Latenzer designed the building. Ground-breaking ceremonies were held in the spring of 1906, and the building was completed in early 1908, and it included, interestingly, a band room and what they called a spa with kitchen. I often wondered what that was, and a banquet hall and a locker room. Uh, still, uh, opposition flared, and J. Sterling Morton called the building a monument to the still-lurking Machiavellianism of public moral sentiment that the end justifies the means. It is a bewildering puzzle in ethics. Gosh, tough words. Well, we get the building open January 26th of 1908. The Temple Building opens the theater uh, with a performance of George Bernard Shaw's You Can Never Tell. Uh, later, uh, the regents will approve changing part of the function of the building uh, to a high school. And during World War I, the high school will move. But first of all, we will have uh, Temple High School, authorized 1907. Uh, in 1908, it opened 
Uh, it was a tuition school. It was not. It was sort of part of the University of Nebraska in that it was teacher training for high school. Uh, it was also open to the faculty's children, but open as well to children from the uh, community as well. Uh, probably the primary thing they intended to do with the Temple High School was to take people who had come from, say, a Sand Hills eight-year high school where they might have come to the University of Nebraska unable to complete certain chemistry or uh, science requirements or even English. They could then complete classes up to the 12-year level in Temple High School, kind of like junior division a little bit later on. I think this is one of the things that they had in mind for it. Then comes along World War I, and we will have to move the function of Temple High School out uh, and move it away. Uh, during the Depression, interestingly enough, back to the Temple Building, they served lunches to faculty and uh, students and others uh, for a dime. Supper was 15 cents to 25 cents. 1954, Howell Theater was completed. Uh, and at that point in time, KUON Television was also there in the basement. Uh, they had a $100,000 studio in the basement, which, was, uh, which were from funds given to the university by Fetzer, who had also given Channel 12 to the University of Nebraska. By 1970s, the building was in pretty tough shape, uh, and in fact, it even had been condemned by the state fire marshal. We don't worry too much about that. He condemned, do you remember, the state uh, mental hospital three times over, I think, 30 or 40 years, and it still was standing and still in use. Uh, but the legislature then ordered a examination of the building, and it was determined that the building should be raised. Unfortunately, they could not appropriate enough money to raise the building. Ah, so it was accidentally saved. Uh, and major, major renovation was planned instead. And then in 2004, uh, Johnny Carson gave $5.3 million, and the building was, again, completely uh, redone, although if you look at it from the outside, uh, it looks like much like this. Uh, you can't see the addition of the Howell Theater and so forth. There is a plaque inside the building honoring Elijah Benjamin Andrews, uh, but it does not mention Mr. Rockefeller at all, nor does it say what happened to the spa with kitchen. I never have found that. So. At that point in time, Temple High School will move into the just completed Teachers High School building. Uh, and to tell you a little bit more about where it was located or to define it perhaps a little bit better, this would be Teachers College building, which is directly across the street to the west from the Student Union building. And it still sits there. And in fact, if you can find the right vantage, you can still read Teachers College up at the top. Uh, another picture which shows this building, we can see there's nothing to the left of it in this picture. But I like this picture. This is the back of the building. This would be the north side of the Teachers College building because as we expand off of the original 10 acres, four square block tract of land, we're going to have to buy housing. We're going to have to buy little grocery stores and drug stores and businesses that have developed there. So as we build, just like we see happening at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, we're going to have to buy houses. But we're not spending in Omaha like they do, you know, $250,000, $350,000 for a house. A lot of these houses are pretty, pretty minor. Yeah, Matt. Was the purpose of having Temple High School to help with the Omaha? Yeah, we call it Teacher's High School now. Was that strictly to help train teachers on Okay, the question uh, from Matt is, was the, why was there a high school, and was it strictly to train, train teachers? Well, as I said, I think originally it was probably to help bring students up to grade level, uh, but it's probably, as far as the regents were concerned, coupled with that, was a high school training ground for teachers. In other words, teachers learning to teach high school. And that makes it a good uh, match with the teacher's college building. Uh, and I think most of the teachers, the high school then called Teachers High, is going to be in the basement of this building. And it's still rather small. Um, that will change in a minute again. So, sir? It is, uh, Bob's question, is it the forerunner of University High? It absolutely is. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1955, uh, about a million dollars was spent to build a building on the northeast corner of 14th and Vine. 
uh, where Bob and I mentioned there was a farm kind of in that area there and towards the east. With, uh, I remember chicken coops and pigs running around. It was just absolutely a, a hovel. Uh, so it was a, a good, good change to that. So at that point in time, University High School was built. So it's had three names, then Temple High School, Teachers High School, then University High School. And University High School had a full-blown high school building with gymnasium, cafeteria, auditorium, and classrooms. And of course, the building is still there. Uh, enrollment at that point in time increased to a little over 300. So now we can allow the school to grow. But it's still, at this point, I think we would find that its primary reason for being no longer to bring students up to a high school level, because now a 12th grade education is pretty standard throughout the state of Nebraska, uh, but rather to provide a training gown for high school teachers. Now, jointly paid for, but we'll see what happens to that in a minute. Right at that point in history, the university controls it. Uh, we have another school on the university campus, which is a grade school, Bancroft School. Now, Bancroft had originally been built, and it was down at, oh, let's call it about 8th, 7th, and T, something like that. That's where Bancroft School was. Uh, so we're going to build the new Bancroft School. It will become the new elementary school teaching school for that's a, that sentence is becoming quite convoluted. I think I'll start over. Uh, elementary school teachers taught in Bancroft to learn teaching skills, okay? Another convoluted sentence, but I think you get it. Uh, now, in 1963, Bancroft will close as a teaching school for elementary, and the new elementary training school for teachers will be called Claire McPhee. And Claire McPhee is built to the south of the Capitol building. And interestingly enough, here what we have is, this now answers your question, the Lincoln Public Schools now pay part of the cost, the University of Nebraska pays part of the cost of building Claire McPhee. Same thing is going to happen when we're going to close University High School. We're going to build East High School. And East High School will be the new laboratory for high school students. And I think we've got a picture of, yeah, of East High, originally junior and senior. Uh, Bancroft was then raised in about the year 2000, and the Kaufman Center was built in its place. And the Kaufman Center is kind of a combination, as I understand it, of classrooms and dormitories for uh, students, okay, East High. And of course, East High, we'll talk about, it's probably going to be a year or two before we talk about East High coming about on top of an old golf course which belonged to the Veterans Administration Hospital. That story will come later. Now, the next building will be the building which we today call the Coliseum Building. Uh, in the 1890s, and before that, of course, basketball uh, was played in Grant Memorial Hall in the auditorium there. Uh, the gym director uh, in 1895 established an eight-man ba or seven-man basketball team uh, with games in Grant Hall, but it was very inadequate uh, in fact, some schools uh, are soon going to refuse to play the University of Nebraska there because, like Nebraska Wesleyan's uh, floor for a while, it is exactly the same size as the basketball court, uh, which sounds okay, except you've got to realize that the bleachers and the observers are right on the edge of the court on all four sides, which means that if you are the coach or if you are a player on the sidelines waiting to play, you're on the court. And as the action comes toward you, have to run out of the way. So it's very, very confined. And by 1915, the coach Jumbo Steam, S-T-I-E-H-M, Steam Roller, <laughs> Jumbo Steam was his uh, uh, nickname, he lamented and uh, went to the Alumni Association and urged them to get busy and build a building for a proper basketball court. <coughs> Uh, this is the first proposal for a building, uh, obviously not going to come about. This proposal will be for more than just a basketball court. It will be a building which they're going to call a memorial building, which will have meeting rooms, auditoriums, as, and other functions, uh, as well as the basketball courts. And, of course, we're going to have to start buying up houses again uh, to the north of the campus. 1920, they start buying up houses. 
Um, this is the beginning of the construction. Looks like a Quonset building here. I think this one shows we're, we've got the building actually completed in this picture, but it has still got houses around it. So we're still in the process of buying houses and, uh, and removing them. Well, the original building was the multi-purpose building. Uh, sometimes it was called the Nebraska Soldiers Memorial. Uh, the stadium would be to the left. And they also planned to put in between there where, as I mentioned earlier, the softball, baseball diamonds were, they wanted to put in an open outdoor Greek theater. That didn't come about either, uh, where they could stage in the summertime. Uh, but the 5,000 seat community building, which we saw the, the proposal for, they promised it would be for community use. In other words, we could be meeting there, hopefully. Uh, so the American Legion Club got on the bandwagon since it was going to be a memorial and they started raising funds. Uh, unfortunately, it was pretty slow. Uh, in 1922, John Selleck uh, enters the picture and he approached them and said that the association should uh, uh, target more monies for the building. Uh, and George Holmes, who had the first trust company, uh, said, well, they would put up money to finance it, like on a loan, uh, because interestingly enough, as you have pledges for money, uh, that's great, but no contractor is going to want to start building on pledges. So George Holmes will step in more than once, first trust company, uh, and offer to do it. Now, to at least finance it. Now, the university is not going to have any ownership in this building. And as funds did not seem to be coming in, um, the university steps into the picture and says, if you will let this building have a different function than this community function, we will pay for it. Uh, first of all, they said, we cannot have the dirt floor uh, unless it is coverable. So the dirt floor would be coverable with temporary basketball floors or dance floors and so forth, and a wooden floor for the basketball court. Well they go back and forth and back and forth and finally agree that the building will not have a community feature. It will not have a dirt floor with removable basketball courts, but permanent basketball courts and, lo and behold, a swimming pool we tacked on to the north edge of the building. So the regents then approved this new plan for the new building that we saw completed and uh, the university will become the, the new one and they will also insist on having a stage on the north end of the building, which is uh, sort of still there as well. May of 1925, the Coliseum was completed uh, and June 5th of 1926, the first commencements were held there. This is a rather recent picture of the building, but you need not worry, you can drive, drive down Vine Street or V Street and see it today. Originally, Vine Street was called V Street, by the way. Uh, v Street became Vine Street for a while at about 18th Street, and then ultimately the city said, let's make this one street contiguous. And so a couple of streets will get named, renamed at that time. Uh, my favorite is University Place, which was a street name. And they were at least accidentally or clever, clever enough to know that V Street corresponded with the additions to the east, which they called Vine, so it was able to all be Vine Street. And University Place becomes U Street. So all these streets kind of go away. A really rotten picture. <laughs> but we're standing on top of uh, Morrill Hall, and we're looking towards the south, and I only put it in to show you where all those houses were located. It's a very, very bad picture, so we won't leave it up there for any period of time. Uh, this picture is taken from probably the top of the chemistry building, the new building, Avery Laboratory, and we're looking towards the southeast, and I put this one up to show you a couple of things. There's Teachers High School, or Teachers High and the Teachers College building, kind of standing all by itself over there. Um, all the houses have been torn away and raised, and a mall is beginning to develop in there. Uh, on the left, we have Andrews, and where we have Burnett later coming on, Halls, we see is a tennis court here temporarily. Uh, Three-story buildings over there are uh, housing on the upper floors, apartments. Lower floor, has one of them has a drugstore. Uh, one of them has a restaurant in it called Dirty Earl's. And Dirty Earl's was a, owned by Earl Wood, who had the Wood Dairy in Lincoln. Uh, 
probably wasn't as dirty as it sounded, but it was a student uh, greasy spoon, if you will. So this kind of gives us an interesting look at the campus as it's beginning to develop. And houses, of course, again to the left. This is where the Selleck Quadrangle would be built, where those three-story buildings and houses are in the center of the picture. Um, kind of looked like this, I think, when I started the university, or at least as I got ready to start the university. This is, again, that area which we saw developing as a mall. And here we have World War II barracks buildings brought in as what were called temporary. Temporary J, temporary B, and so forth. Uh, social science building is on the left. The two-story building on the right uh, in the background is the geography building, uh, which by the time Bob and I got there, uh, they felt nece necessary to change it to the university police department. And I think I mentioned maybe last time or the time before that the university police, when we were in school, had about two policemen. Uh, I think they have more than that now. And, of course, they operated out of this building with very little else. The, the building to the left of... Um, the geography building is Grant Memorial Hall. And to the left of that, we can see the original chemistry building. The chemistry building, Grant Hall, geography building will all come down uh, to make way for Sheldon and a little parking lot, which is to the north. I can't quite put it exactly in perspective, but I think we talked about it, where geography building is here. Probably is parking lot to the north of uh, of Sheldon, but it's it's a little nebulous that I have to look at a little more careful drawing. And the geography building is the bottom of an upper case E building, which was designed by Kimball to be the first part of a larger building that never came about. We talked about that last time as well. Uh, meantime, we're looking back now, World War II times, and we can see clear on the right-hand side of the picture the two three-story buildings, the edges of one of the buildings, Dirty Earls, and a bunch of houses in there, again, where we're later going to find um, Select Quadrangle. And we can see the middle has become a mall. We can also see troops. Uh, Tom? Yes, uh, the houses and Dirty Earls set on 14th Street. The same, this would be the edge of um, uh, the Student Union as well. And where these soldiers are marching down here, these troops were standing literally in the middle of a street. And again, while Bob and I were in school, this was an open street, uh, which was really one of the best things that happened to the university was to close these through streets going through there. So 13th Street went through right there. Uh, but what we see here, these troops are primarily being quartered in the uncompleted, virtually completed, Love Library. Now, during World War I, the Temple Building during World War I became a USO and a cafeteria uh, for World War I students who were at that time quartered in the uncompleted Social Sciences Building. Uh, so during every war we have found other uses, but as soon as they leave. Uh, maybe I've already mentioned this, but one of the people that I knew who was a cadet, if you will, lived in Love Library was Robert Knoll. Professor Robert Noll, the English teacher. So he studied there and lived there and while he was a student at the University of Nebraska. That may be him down on the left-hand corner. Kind of looks like the top of his head. Uh, so Andrews is completed. Uh, Andrews was built beginning in 1927. Uh, the quadrangle, they called it then, became a drill field in 1942. Um, the dental college. Uh, we'll move into Andrews. Uh, this is a picture of the dental college, one of the upper floors of Andrews, which was, again, still there while we were in the university. Uh, then 1966-1967, the new dental college will be built on what they call the East Campus, but I still call the Ag Campus. Okay, We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, this picture was given to me by uh, the dean of the, the dental school, Ralph Ireland, who told another story, uh, interesting <laughs> uh, and possibly apocryphal, and and Ralph isn't around to substantiate it any longer. But the original dental school that sat in there had moved from the old Lansing Theater building downtown into this building. And when it moved over there, they brought equipment with them. And Ralph Ireland, while he was the dean, felt great pressure for new, what they called stations, where dentists learned to become dentists and practice. Uh, However, he went to the company that supplied these, and I'll call them stations. I'm not sure what the exact word would be. He went to them and said, I need X number of stations, and this is how much money I have. 
and the supplier says, well, that's nice, but you're, you, you don't have enough money to even really think about this. Um, and so as he we're going to remove the proposal, he said, however, uh, our company, whatever than the company was, manufactures two different types of stations to train dentists. Some are for left-handed dentists, some are for right-handed dentists, and they have different layouts. We have overproduced stations for left-handed dentists. If you will accept all left-handed stations, we will build the dental college for you at the cost of what you have in your budget. And they did. So, uh, as I've said since, if you ended up with a dentist who you always thought was fumbling around a little bit in your mouth, maybe he was a right-handed dentist that learned on a left-handed station. Can't confirm this, but it's a great story. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, Ralph Ireland, I never knew to, to lie to somebody. Maybe it's true. Who knows? Uh, the next building we'll talk briefly about is the Student Union building. And, and I'm sure that probably all of you know we're only touching on a few buildings. And there are many buildings on the campus which should have more attention to them. We'll only touch on a few of them. That, that's maybe, maybe down the road we'll come back and do a few of them. Uh, the Dental College, you know, it has a story all to itself. Um, in 1899, the University of Nebraska Dental College, for example, was attached to Cotner University in Bethany. And later, when they moved over to 15th and O, Cotner University will still provide the science classes for the, them. Uh, 1903, uh, still Cotner University, uh, and so forth. So, a lot of stories we're not going to cover, but moving on to the student union. The 1920s is when we started talking about a student union, and I had mentioned it, remember, when they built the temple building. I don't think it was even seriously considered it the last time. Maybe that's what the spa was, I don't know. But in the 20s, they, dis they discussed it again, but as the 20s ended, the Depression began, and all thoughts of a student union were sort of dismissed. Then with, uh, after the Depression, the New Deal, uh, PWA and so forth, uh, a new idea came to build a student union building. And the PWA was created, and the students approached the PWA uh, seeking funds. Uh, Ultimately, $400,000 worth of revenue bonds were issued, and the WPA, all these alphabets get all tangled into everything, but the WPA will put up $300,000. The building will be built as we see it, uh, Virginia Brick, Bedford, Indiana Stone, the architects Davis and Wilson in Lincoln. And if you stand in the right place and look at the building, it looks just like this today, pretty much. We're looking towards the northeast. The lower level of the building, they moved the Daily Nebraska newspaper from the old main building, University Hall. Uh, there was also a lunchroom down there. The first floor had a major lounge, phone booths. Young people today, phone booths? What's a phone booth? Uh, we all carry our phone booths today. Uh, my favorite was what they called the coking room. Um, I suppose it was a soda fountain. If you said coking room today, it would probably have an entirely different function, but uh, also they had a 200-seat cafeteria uh, and a couple of sit-down restaurants. And uh, again, while we were in the university, uh, that cafeteria was an excellent place to eat. And the sit-down uh, restaurant, which was over in the southeast corner of the building, uh, was uh, a fine place to eat. The faculty ate there. Uh, today, none of those fine restaurants exist anymore. It's all uh, fast food. I don't think that they have ca catering and they do serve banquets and so forth, but I'm afraid they're pretty much gone. Uh, the one feature of the original building, which is still there, kind of worked around, uh, was the second and third ballroom, which was 60 by 90 feet. Uh, you can kind of find traces of this, particularly when you walk around on the outside there or on the hallway, you can see door, double doors, with kind of a balcony function which goes nowhere, and those originally opened out onto the ballroom. Uh, so you can find remnants of what were, what was probably uh, the uh, student union buildings as it existed then. Uh, we're going to add on to it and add on to it and add on to it. Originally, the student union building was one of those buildings which didn't technically belong to the University of Nebraska because it was paid for with student fees. 
Uh, and so if you want to look technically at it, some people say the football stadium is not owned by the University of Nebraska. It's pretty, you know, they think it is. But nonetheless, technically you might say that. Um, and then we're going to the original mortgage will burn in 1952. And then in 1995, the regents will proportion $12.6 million to build the first addition to the Student Union Building, which we see here in the Baroy Hill Fountain. Um, we build around that today. You can't even hardly find that part of the building. Uh, the Baroy Hill Fountain has even been removed itself. We have five minutes, to, uh, John. Something like that. Okay. Uh, I think we'll we'll do this one and then we'll close for the day. This is the uh, original dormitory built for the University of Nebraska. Um, it started as a private institution, as a dormitory. Uh, unfortunately, it did not work. Uh, it was too far away from the University of Nebraska to be utilized by the students. It was on the footprint, virtually, of Bancroft School. So it was on the northeast corner of roughly of 14th and R, R Streets, and kind of R, U, right in that neighborhood. Streets weren't all there at that time. Uh, so it was built by private investors. It did not work, even though the price for a student was very low. They would not walk this far to campus. No, it's not even the middle of the campus. Now it's uh, well past the middle of the campus. Um, so at that point in time, the building, they sold it, and it was bought by a private individual in Lincoln um, who gave it to the Roman Catholic Church, and it was turned into a boarding school. We can see the cross up on top. Um, it's known variously, but primarily as the Convent of the Homely Child, a boarding school. Uh, at its height, it had 12 teachers and 35 students, so it didn't work either. Uh, in 1895, a portion of the building uh, was utilized by a Lincoln physician by the name of Dr. Benjamin F. Bailey, who started a hospital in the building. Uh, Dr. Benjamin F. Bailey will later purchase Lincoln Normal College at 56th and South Streets. He will move out of there. Uh, he'll also move temporarily and operate what's known as Lincoln Lutheran Hospital, uh, which we know today is, was then and is now all of Tabitha. That was for a time his hospital. So this building, which was uh, just frame construction, will be removed. Bancroft School will be rebuilt here from down at like 8th and T. And the old Bancroft School will become um, Hill and Niden's uh, offices and will be used for scrapyards, more or less, and it will, be, it will stand for a good long time. Uh, then in the 2000s, even Bancroft School, as I mentioned, will come down, uh, and the Kaufman Center will be built. It'll be, it'll be grass for quite a while, but later it will just become the Kaufman Center. Okay, uh, a good spot to end for the day, and we'll see if there are any questions uh, in the audience. Anybody a question at all? Yeah. Yes. The houses that you talked about earlier that were appeared to be in that general vicinity of this building? Uh, the question was, uh, were the houses which I showed in the vicinity of this building? Some of them would have been near it, but we don't know that they were right on top of this, that there were any houses. For example, there was a Methodist church uh, just to the south across the street which would be kind of up in the northeast corner of uh, Selleck Quadrangle. It was a Methodist church. Um, Kent Lowell, do you remember what the name of that one was? Yeah, I can't remember. They're going to merge and become, is it Christ Methodist on uh, Holder, or Randolph? Yeah. yeah. So they'll, uh, sorry? They merged with Elm Park. Elm Park. Okay. Some of the windows from that church are in, uh, I think it's Christ Methodist. Yeah, uh, Elm Park then merged with Christ Methodist. Oh, okay. Everything merges with everything. <laughs> okay, so I don't think I answered your question completely, but I, we don't know that there were specifically, we could go back and check, but I've never done it. There are houses right there. It certainly came right up to it. And if you would go to the north, this was literally the country at that point in time. Uh, one of the interesting things that they found uh, in the construction of this building was dinosaur bones, which is kind of interesting because there's Morrill Hall right across the street. Now, we don't know much about those dinosaur bones, you know, whether there were any more or not, just noted as having found dinosaur bones there. Uh, okay, another question. I didn't even exactly answer that one, but like a true politician, I did answer a question. Just didn't have to be that question. Yes? Here were they doing the viewing for the uh, dental stations? 
Say it again. When, when were they doing the deal for the dental station? The they dental station, this would have been in the 1960s, probably, 19, late 1950s, early 1960s, because they're going to build the new dental college with all new facilities. And I think that was 66, 67, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, wasn't, wasn't Claire McPhee built where uh, Capital School was? Yes, Claire McPhee sits uh, on the same, at least, maybe not the same footprint, but in the same square block uh, of, of uh, Capitol School. Matt? Yeah, you mentioned that this building was a building part of the Church. Was that was John Fitzgerald? Uh, the question was, was it John Fitzgerald? Yes, it was John Fitzgerald who bought this building uh, from the private investors whose names I have someplace. If you're curious, I can bring it back next time. Uh, and, and John Fitzgerald's house became um, Mount Emerald Historic District. His house sat pretty much in the middle of the tract which went from A Street to D Street, from 17th Street to 20th Street. Pretty much in the middle of the area was Fitz, Fitzgerald's house. This is Fitzgerald without a capital G in the middle. All right, Phyllis? <laughs> because the Fitzgerald house, which still stands on the southeast corner of 20th and D, which was known originally as Fitzgerald Avenue, is the Fitzgerald who owned Fitzgerald Dry Goods. They put a capital G in the middle of their name and they wanted you to know they were not in any way related to John Fitzgerald, who we will be talking about, and is known as Lincoln's first millionaire. And he was indeed. Did I answer that question? Okay, I think I did. Another question? Well, there's a new fountain there. Do they call it the Broy Hill Fountain? Uh, I don't know. But the original Broy Hill Fountain is gone, and now it's just kind of a, an open area with kind of rocks sitting, and I think you can kind of walk through it. It's an open-air sort of plaza fountain, uh, unlike the defined fountain, which the Broy Hill was. Now, they may call the new fountain the Broy Hill Fountain. I don't know, because, of course, it was a, a memorial originally. Uh, but if they do, I'm not sure what, the, what they do call a fountain now. Another question? If not, something just went click. I thank you very much. <laughs>